Hello everyone, welcome to unit number three of operations management. Today we're going to be looking at the design of goods and services and managing quality. So in this unit we're going to be starting to look on what are the current problems of a product or what consumers are looking for in order for us to design it, right? So for example, when we think about, let's say for example, there's a, there's a video here, which I'm going to, Right. Yeah. So this one, we are talking about the Nike shoes, right? So I want you to look at this video and understand that what kind of quality are we looking for and what kind of design we're looking for. So here is performance, right? That is the key word in there, performance at the sports level and the same as fashion, right? It stops being, uh, as in we have in here, we have stops being a utilitarian product means just for sports it becomes fashion it becomes trend it becomes many many things right so for that matter like i said we have to understand how we're gonna design it right and the, the product decision is to develop and implement a product strategy that meets demands of the marketplace that means if we're going to have a good design of a certain shoe, for example, in this case, a Nike shoe, are we able to cope with the production of it in terms of how many we can produce? And if it has a very specific types of uh, production, can we, are we able to only produce that shoe because they have many others on the line, right? So which ones are most important, which others are not? Because in the end, I can spend a lot of resources in designing it, but if it takes a lot of time, then it may jeopardize some other things that I have on the line. So we always have to be very strategic on what kind of product we're going to develop, the demand that we have to it, and the production time and resources that we need for it. Okay, so in this case, we talk about that. So in this case, we we have to think always on of the product life cycles, right? So in this case, a, um, we have... First of all, the development time, it depends on the on the time on, on the product, right? Some products like technology will take lesser time than some others. And then we have to think of how we're gonna profit out of it. So here, as you can see, we have firstly in the introduction and growth, it's mostly a loss for the company, right? So this is a time where we develop a good product or something, but again, the more resources I put on it the most likely the beginning of the development is going to be a loss. means I'm just trying to recover the most that I make. Some products make it into the maturity where we really make a profit. And sometimes others products, they don't make it. You know, there's there's products that um, over time, doesn't matter how successful they look. In reality, they don't, they don't work. Why? Because the market is unpredictable sometimes. So as much as we can do a forecast and we do a market analysis, sometimes the consumer just just it doesn't go through right so here we're looking at that that we pass from from this this is specific line where we pass from loss to profit is very critical and the same thing as the majority of the consumers start to adopt it okay very good so in this case we have to do a product by value analysis so a product by value analysis uh, these are products in descending order of the individual dollar contribution to the firm. So in this case, we have also a list of products. Like I was saying, we have all the Nike issues. So which ones bring a better value to the consumer? Which ones have a higher profit? We can say, for example, a Jordan, Jordan sneaker can be very high in value in terms of the revenue that it produces. But in terms of the number, we don't sell that much. We may have some other sneakers that are easier to produce, require much less investment in terms of the R&D, and they sell very well. Maybe those Nike shoes that you are talking about, $50 or so, no, they are more for the masses rather than a Nike, a Jordan shoe that could be uh, $250, $300, or even if it's a special edition, it could be up to $1,000, right? So anyways, we always have a list of products because in the end, we have to understand who, which products are stars, which one are cash cows, which ones are puzzles, we don't know what to do with them, and which ones, again, are like milking cows or so. So hey, uh, that one, I'm mixing a little bit of marketing, uh, but uh, you should already know about all that. So very good. So 
First of all, when we generate new products, we have to do a couple things, right? So first of all, a, the product mix, we, we have to understand firstly the consumer, who they are, what they want. So here in your final project, you're going to be looking at what the consumer is looking for, right? So I can, I can start from there, or if there's already a service or a product, what is failing on it? And then I have to understand what they want. Right. Second thing I have to understand if there's any economic changes, sociological or demographic, how the people is changing. So nowadays, for example, people, do they want cheaper products or they want higher quality products? Or, for example, we can look at socially responsible products. That is happening a lot, right? That many uh, companies are looking to be more socially responsible. We need to understand if there's any technological changes. For example, now we we don't see it in that video, but for example, Reebok has a 3D printed shoes, right? So in this case, they developed that technology. And that means with the 3D printed shoes, that means you have more variety of products or you can customize the products for the consumer. So nowadays also consumers, they want very unique products. They don't want fashions where they look like everyone. They want something very unique, right? And then we have other changes such as uh, suppliers or distributors or etc. Et so we have to think of many things that could be changing and how we're going to adapt the product or how we're going to launch new products to match all those new changes or those developments. So, uh, so in this case, in the product development system, we, we're looking at an effective product strategy that links the production decisions. That means, first of all, we understand what the consumer wants how much they're willing to pay for it, when they want it, how often they want it, how many they're willing to purchase. And then based on that, we also have to look at the production system. Am I able to cope with that production or do I need to increase my facilities? Do I need to increase the, the, the workforce? Do I need to outsource from someone else? So all of those decisions, we have to think of them. And again, we have to integrate all of the TM, T, 10 OM decisions we would talk about already on unit number one, right? Which is managing the resources, managing the people, the facilities, the quality, etc., etc., etc. So in this case also, we have what is the quality function deployment, which is, first of all, determining what will satisfy the consumer. And then, like I said, translating that into consumer, those, des those desires into a target design, what we want to do. And that is, uh, we, we use a, a tool that is called the house of quality, which we try to match. In this case, we're not gonna, we're not gonna learn it in this course, but pretty much that, that house of quality matches what the consumer wants and what the consumers needs. And we have, areas that they that they match or not all right so when we talk about the product development again it's, it's a whole process right so first of all it comes from an idea i think the consumer wants this kind of new shoe let's take for example uh a, the look of uh this this shoes is called uh i i forgot the name I but I'm, I'm gonna search for it and i'll tell you now Rockport, Rockport shoes. Rockport shoes is the Adidas version of a shoe, of a dress shoe. So in this case, they say, well, we are going to develop, the consumer needs also working shoes, not only sneakers, but if we launch it as Adidas, we are giving the wrong idea and people may not, they don't want to work with sneakers, right? They still need to wear suits and so. So in this case, it comes up concepts, feasibility, can we carry out the idea as Adidas? Yes, we have designer of shoes, we have the materials, we have the facilities, etc., etc. And then, of course, that match. And then we have here the scope for design and engineering team. So in this case, we we have to understand how those shoes are gonna work in terms of manufacturing, what dimensions we need, the amount of supplies, the plastic, the leather, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we have to test the market to see whether the consumer really wants to use those shoes or not. And actually, they were very successful. Uh, successful in the sense that, that they managed to sell a lot, but in the end, it's still a very niche product because in the end, it's uh, shoes that are mm, double the price of normal shoes. So again, then we have, of course, 
introduction to the market, which it works, and then the evaluation of the most consumers that says, well, this is a good product or really is not so fantastic. <laughs> well, okay. So in this case, we have a, we need to think of organizing the team. So in this case, we have product development teams. Product development teams, we're talking about multifunctional teams. We have people, we have to have people from marketing. Why? Because they know the supply that we're going to need, the numbers that we need in terms of like, we're, we're planning to sell 2 billion shoes, manufacturing how many we need to produce, purchasing what materials we need to produce, quality assurance, making sure that those products match the quality requirements. And of course, service, field service, which is in this case, if we are going to sell the product, also we need to understand what the consumers are often looking for, right? So in this case, we also have the concurrent engineering, which is Mm, we don't do step by step, meaning we, we finish first developing and then we manufacture. No, as soon as we have an idea, perhaps we start with some models of, uh, of the shoe and then we start manufacturing and then somehow we make sure that while we're manufacturing, we test other models and so on. So we're doing many things at the same time to so to maximize the, the product development remember i told you there's some products that we need to quickly develop year by year in the case of nike shoes actually it's a year by year too so if we have concurrent engineering we can finish faster right so in his case we also we have the manufacturability and value engineering which is in this case uh we have to do the design of the product so that we can maximize the production time and also the maximize the production line. There are some products that, let's say, for example, if I have the base of this shoe, I can just ch change the top design to five different designs, and that becomes more efficient for me as a shoe that only has one type of production. So in this case, for example, if we look at the Nike Air, you know, with the same platform, we can do six or 10 different, different types of shoes. So in this case, we're talking also about value engineering. Right. So in this case, like I said, when we're talking about for design of manufacturability, first of all, we are looking again, and I'm repeating a little bit of what I mentioned just now, which is reducing the complexity of the product. The less complicated things this has is easier to produce. We have the less need to change it to another machine or change the components of the machine. So when we can do it. Reduction of environmental impact, we also can say that we spend less resources. A standardization of components, which is we try to make it standardized, right? So we have mm, 10 lines of shoes, we use the same machine, and that works very well. Functional aspects of the product, improving a generation by generation of products, improve them and make them work better. Then again, we have improved job design and job safety. The same thing is not only about producing those shoes well. It's also making sure that employees are producing them in a safe manner, that also uh, we care about the employees as well. We have maintainability or serviceability of the product. In this case, this we would not, let's talk about talking about shoes. We're talking about machines. For example, when we're talking about a good quality product, means it doesn't need any further service down the road or have some warranties that it can work for eight, nine years without any servicing. And then we talk about robust design. A robust design is already a product that has good functions that is somehow foolproof. Means in the production line works very well, has very little mistakes. Uh, design wise, it's already perfect. Means it's a product that is already stable. Okay, so in this case, uh, yeah, like I said, in this case, we have a product that is designed so that small variations in production or assembly do not affect the products. In this case, we have already a product that is very stable, like I was mentioning before. Then we have uh, the some other issues for the product design. We have the modular design. So in this case, um, this is precisely what I was mentioning about the, the Nike Air shoes. We have the module of the platform and then different areas produce different parts. So at the same same time that I'm producing the bottom, I could be producing some other tops on another parts of the production line. 
Another thing that we have in product design is CAD or AutoCAD. Actually, now we, we, so we do it a lot. And actually, you can see it in the video how the shoes are designed, designing the computer. A, we can test a lot of the movement. We can test a lot of the functions. And somehow by computer, we can test them and then construct them and then try them physically. This goes together with also some companies doing the virtual reality, which is, um, we, we uh, again, these softwares have the capacity to test the materials in an almost real equation. That means it tastes like, for example, the forces, the gravity forces, etc. So we can do it like that. And also we can see them physically right now. Uh, it, it, I mean, in the future, we say that we're going to be able to, with the glasses, to see, touch, move the product along and see the real dimensions, right? So we have the value analysis. In this case, a um, the value analysis, we do it along all the production line. How can we add value to the product? In this case, for example, by maximizing all the production to only one line, that creates value because I need less resources. That means the production is cheaper and that means that can be translated into savings for the consumer or savings for me. That means profit. Okay. And then, of course, we talk about sustainability, which in general, we're talking about the product and the design. So we're talking about whether um, environmentally also we can do better products as well. Right. So we can talk about that. So in this case, we have, for example, here, the product development continuum which is talking about how, um, how fast we need to develop a product, right? There's some life cycles that are very quick. So for that matter, I cannot spend so much time in the research and development and I need someone to produce it for me. So I need someone that really knows about that. For example, that we had talked about before in some other units about Samsung phones and microprocessors. Microprocessors need to be developed by someone else because I need to produce it very quickly. So now here we're going to talk about just very technical things and I'm not going to go through in depth because we're not going to see them too much. But um, in the process of production, we need to have the engineering drawings, which nowadays, nowadays are done by computer. We see how in the computer they look like, the dimensions, etc., because that is going to go into the actual production line. The bill of material, bill of material is very important. Because here is where we see what materials are required to produce a certain item. So in this case, if we're talking about the shoes, I need to have I need to have the sufficient quality quality quantity of leather, sufficient quantity of plastic, fabric, and all the materials that possibly are involved into the production of this product. In this case, also we have the we have to do a make or buy decision, which is. Am I going to produce it on my own facilities or I'm going to outsource it to someone else? And then so in this case, uh, we, we have to decide that based on our capabilities and core competencies. Right. So in this case, we have also a the crypt technology, which is a product or a component coding system that specifies the size, shape or type processing. So in this case, um, when we talk about, again, <laughs> the shoes itself, Grouping technology will be, for example, all the soles. So we can produce all the soles at a certain uh, machine because that machine only requires the, the plastic. So in this case, we can group those into different, into the same group. Here, for example, here I have it. Uh, we have groups, no, this one's, th this types, for example, is the same one. In this case, I can tell you, we can just do plastic, air, this one, right? The other one can be just plastic without air. The other one would be, a another one the zoom version of nike so in this case like i said we have groups of different products or items okay so uh in this case we have a and also a when we are doing when we're doing this we have the service design which is a process chain network analysis so in this case um i will optimize the interaction between my company and the consumers how can i make it faster more efficient and so on let's let's talk a little bit here a different product which is in the service design we talk about mcdonald's 
So for example, here we have, for example, uh, McDonald's will limit the options. If you realize the patty is the same all the time, doesn't matter if it's a, well, except for a quarter pounder, but if it's a big Mac, da, 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 all the hamburgers, the patty is exactly the same. So in this case, that's what we do. We delay customization. That means the bread, the fries, the lettuce is the same, right? Then we have the modularization, which is, so bread, hamburger, cheese is the same, but then we have the module of a Big Mac, we have the model of a cheeseburger, we have the model of a 1950 something hamburger. So in this case, we have it like that, right? Then we hop to automation. So in this case, for example, automation in McDonald's happens at the French fries. When we have the French fries, they put uh, <laughs> they put the fries in the fryer and then they just put one minute. Some of the fryers already have an automatic upload, download. The quantity is already automated. When they have, for example, a big machine where they just press a button. They, well, they put the basket and they put press a button and then in that basket will fill the exact amount of fries that requires a, the, for the frying machine. And finally, design for the moment of truth, which is the consumption. In this case, McDonald's have designed all this process that is done all at the same time in order to deliver at one minute. So in this case, they design it in a sense that how the kitchen is laid out so that they can deliver very quickly. Okay, very good. So in this case, uh, well, I'm not, just, I'm not going to go into this one very good. We have the transition trees to product design. So in this case, for example, like I said, we have always a decision whether to make it by ourselves or make someone else can make it. So in this case, we use decision trees to say, how much am I going to spend if I do it? How much I'm going to spend if I outsource it? If I use this material, if I don't use this material? Simple as that. Okay, so in this case, you, you see, for example, what is the best option? Use it in this way, use it in this way, or just doing nothing. Okay, so now let me fly there. Okay, very good. So in this case, when we talk about quality, so here we talk always that improved quality a, creates profit. Firstly, a, because we reduce costs in the sense that we don't waste, productivity is not wasted, people know what to do. And then of course, that means that we have consistent products all the time and we don't need to throw them away, right? And the same thing, we don't need to cover for warranties of the consumer returning it because it didn't work. We spend time fixing it, trying to figure out what happened, etc. And the same thing in sales, via sales. So we sell more because we have consistent quality products, okay? So what is quality? So in this case, the, the totality of features and characteristics of a product or service that bears on its ability to satisfy stated or implied needs. So in this case, we have what is quality, because all the features of the product match what the consumer is looking for, right? Sometimes it's very simple functions as turning on and off, good quality, off quality, pff, the switch went off, that already, the, that already is bad quality, switch on, switch off, right? Think of your Daiso products, do they easily spoil or not? <laughs> so in this case, again, we have, quality doesn't happen by accident. We have to have a whole strategic plan to think of the quality. We need to use some quality principles, like for example, a, here we have the total quality management or continuous improvement, which is constantly improving it, benchmarking against other companies, etc. So we have, first of all, like I said, we have a strategy to change things. We put principles or theories in practice. It could be, for example, ISO. The ISO 9000 focuses on the quality of products, means someone externally comes and checks that everything has perfect quality. We have through employees, we train them and we make sure that they know that they produce the best quality product. So when you say, I work for BMW, we don't fail, right? Why? Because we do it perfectly all the time. And then of course, that comes with also customer satisfaction, which is we have to make sure that we always fulfill that quality. So uh, in this case, like I said, the cost of quality, what's the cost of quality? So in this case, for example, we have, again, prevention cost, which is defective parts, we avoid them. Appraisal cost, which is 
cost related to evaluating the products, which is if we know we have very high standards of production, we don't need to check them again. We don't need to do two, three, four, five, six checks. With one check, check is more than enough. So we have also internal failure costs and we have external failure costs, which is, first of all, internal, uh, some materials of the product or so, uh, in the time that we're producing it. And then we have external failure costs, which is we need to, once we deliver the product, then it comes defective. So we have to, uh, we have to refurbish it or fix it or etc. Cetera, et cetera. Right. There you go. So in this case, we have a, we have the total quality management, which is uh, an approach. We have seven concepts. We, we have, first of all, like I said, we have the PDCA, which is a continuous improvement, which is plan, do, check, act. Many companies do that. 3M, for example, does that, which is all the time to plan the production. They produce, they check everything is correctly. If there's any variances, then they fix it. We have a Six Sigma. Six Sigma, a, this one looks at perfection and no, zero waste, which is total quality by avoiding any kind of waste, either time, resources, products, uh, resources, etc. any kind of resources. Okay, then we have the employee empowerment. Like I said, we have an organization that focuses on the, uh, making the... the making the employees better by training them by making a culture of quality right so in this case we have also quality circles that the employees are brainwashed on producing quality products and that is always rewarded because they say if we produce x amount of quality i can pay you more because we sell more etc etc we have also the act of benchmarking for total quality management which is who is the best who we measure ourselves against to the best producer of phones. So we have to produce a phone as good as them, right? So in this case, we, we have that or we set up the standard. We also have, for example, the philosophy behind just in time, which is rather than this was created by Toyota. First of all, is rather than having inventory and having to rework the defective things after a while, everything, we fix it very quickly. That means we receive a product, we fix it, and we let it go out. We never let it go out already with any mistakes. We fix it on the go. Uh, this one also, we have the Taguchi concepts, which is the quality robust, which is, like I said, in this case, um, either already the product is very stable. And then also we have the target-oriented quality, which is a philosophy of continuous improvement. Okay, so... Continuously, we are moving to find what's wrong. And if there's nothing wrong, there's always something that can be improved. You know, so if they say, the other day I was looking, for example, at the uh, um, Dyson machine and the Samsung machine. So the Dyson machine was already a good machine. But what happens? Samsung says, I can go one step further. Continuous improvement. Why? Rather than pressing the button constantly, I can just have an automatic button that lets me vacuum non-stop without pressing the button okay so here for example we look at the quality loss function right so the quality loss function it says that for example we have a target and that means it's the best good fair so the moment that we start to move off the target of the specification of the product the quality starts to drive away that means also the the consumer is saying i cannot accept it okay so let's say, for example, if we took uh, we, we look at the sizes of, let's say, nuts and bolts. If it goes over one millimeter, it's OK. I can accept it. Yes, OK. But then here, it's unacceptable. Anything after maybe three millimeters, I cannot accept it because there's already that the quality is lost. OK, so we use usually this one in terms of see um, what are the standard in terms of quality. Some companies are very stringent. They don't even there's only best and good. They don't accept fair, poor, or unacceptable. That doesn't go in because they know that they need to rework again the product. Okay, very good. So we have the different knowledge of tools of TQM. So in this case, for example, uh, we're, we, we have, we have, for example, here, uh, yeah, 
Where can I put myself? Where can I fly so that I can see everything? <laughs> anyway, let's go through these ones, okay? So first of all, let's talk this one, the check sheet. In this case, we see where are the defects. It's a tool, it's a chart. We see, we mark them and what hours perhaps is perhaps the most changes in variance. So it could be maybe because of an employee or something. We use a scatter diagram to see correlations between uh, a certain factor. Let's say the more employees we have, the better quality we have, or the more graduates we have, the better quality we have. We have the we have the cause and effect, which is the Chicago one. In the Chicago one, we always have we will always attribute that the problem is caused by materials, methods, manpower, or machinery. Those four M's will always cause trouble. So we're gonna list them down and we're gonna classify the failures and try to. Uh, fit them into those ones. Then we have the tools for organizing them. We have also the Pareto chart. Pareto chart we're going to do is an exercise. In this case, we see uh, uh, in the Pareto chart, we're trying to say that two major reasons affect almost everything. So in this case, for example, if I were to say the airplane was late. So we're trying to find out what are the causes for the airplane was late. So for example, consumers are complaining that maybe the customer service is not good. Okay, so uh, consumers of airplanes are, co are complaining that the check-in was too slow. So when we look at, at, at the reasons why they complain, it sums down to what? The employees are not performing well. So in this case, we realize that the airplane being late, the check-in being slow, the customers are the the, the service uh, suppliers are rude is mostly because they are not trained. So we sum it down to all the reasons, or at least eighty percent of them, are derived from a bad training program. And we're gonna look at that later. Okay. We also look at flow charts and to see where are the possible mistakes or what's going on. We also look at histograms to see mostly where the frequency of a certain problem or where we see majority of the problem or we can see statistical process control chart which is we see mostly in terms of the target value how far or how near we are majority of the time and then we can do an average of what's going on in there okay so AI again in order for for quality to happen, we have the role of inspection. We have to see what's going wrong constantly. We need to develop a systematic approach to see where the quality may fail. We have the source inspection, which in this case, again, uh, we do it at the source, at the company, at the factory, not after the product is outside. We have a poca yoke. A poca yoke is, uh, how can I explain it to you? It's, Sometimes when we do a certain process or product, the process or product is prone to do human mistakes. But what happens is, say, for example, there's a bolt and the employee put it backwards. So there were many of the bolts put backwards. But why? Because that bolt can go inward, forwards or backwards. It doesn't matter, right? If it doesn't have a poke yoke. So when we do a poke yoke is we design the products that only can go enter inside if it's forwards. So we design a product so that's error free from human or from processes or people, right? It's a case, for example, when you go uh, the, the long time ago, I said, what happens if I go to the gas station and I put diesel instead of uh, normal gasoline? Then my car is going to explode or what's going to happen? No. The hose itself has a poker yoke because the size is already designed to only be able to go into a certain one. Okay, so that is how it works. We have checklists, things. We always have a systematic things to check, right? The same thing in say in the attribution attribution inspection. In the attributes, we check these attributes complete, 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 complete in the in the checklist, and then we have also variable inspection, which is we check the variances of the product and when the variance started. If there was a variance in the product, means there were some variations, when they started, how often they happen, why they happen, and try to do a whole investigation about it. Okay. So now 
Um, in this one, uh, here we have the total quality management in services. And here we, we, we look into a model. This model was developed by Parasuraman, which is the, the SurfQual. Sitemail or Parasuraman, I, I don't know. But anyways, the offer doesn't matter. So in this case, we have a, in order to have a good service, what should happen? It should happen all of this one. So reliability means consistently, you can rely. No one day I go to the customer service, one day they attend me well, one day not, one day they are reliable, I can trust them, the other no, I don't, okay? This happens because of training mostly. The same thing, responsiveness. If I go, if the proper the train employees properly trained, he will know how to respond rather than saying like, oh, um, I don't know. Let me check. We cannot fix it now. He knows already what to do. And if he doesn't know what to do, he will redirect you to where to do it. Competence, the same thing. The employee must have a certain competence to do, to know the product and know what to do and know what's wrong with it. Here, for example, I am going to use one one example which is lush lush cosmetics creams soaps etc uh they are very well trained into their job they know where the product comes from what are the qualities you can ask them tons of questions and they should be able to respond them and then of course goes together with a courtesy they show you the soaps they test them for you they tell you what's good what's not etc that goes together with the communication as well because in the end they communicate anything of the product with you Credibility, they show you where they source their products. Security, also free from danger, risk or doubt. In this case, they said, for example, that they test their products not in animals. No, So there's one type of security they're providing to you. They know who the customer are and they, of course, they try their best to, to how to say, communicate in the right way with women, the, which is their main, main target segment. And of course, the tangibles. Like I said, in this case, they have the soaps. And you can try them and you can see them and you can feel them and you can smell them and then you can purchase it. It's funny because sometimes like, for example, they have like a, a soap bomb, you will bomb, I don't know, it's a bomb. So you throw it in the water and it's expensive. I think it's like uh, 12,000, 16,000, I can't remember. And it's a one-time soap. And anyways, you go to the to the, to the place and they say, okay, I want to try this one. And they throw it for you, they try it for you. And then you still can buy one more or not. So again, they provide tangibles for you. I'm going to show you one video in this case to see if that works for you. Anyways, that's all for today. Today was a very long unit, but uh, hey, um, this is the way it is. I have no way to shorten it up. Anyways, thank you so much for your time and I'll see you next week.